We're going to try to do things a little bit differently, but remember before we get started to like, comment, subscribe. If you have questions or you have insights, we do read those. We do go through those, and that sometimes becomes the basis of what we talk about in these sessions. But tonight we're going to try to do something that's akin to capturing lightning in a bottle. And the reason why I say that is because after every sermon or after every service, typically the four of us, pastor and others, will have in-depth conversations unpacking a little bit more of the information that, or the meat on the bone that's left behind because you just can't cover everything in the space that we're given. Otherwise, we would have three and four hour services and then I don't know that all of you would be tuning in quite so often because uh, that kind of fills your plate up. So, <laughs> and that has happened before. We, we have experienced that. We've learned our lesson, so to speak. Uh, so I'm going to ask, or I'm going to be kind of seated in the, the seat of the interviewer, if you will, uh, kind of opening the floor to these guys to really expand upon some concepts and some scriptural references and some more connective tissue that really supports the dog people message that AJ brought forward uh, last Sunday. Um, but to start out, I know that AJ always mentions this in his sermons that we, we know he's going to talk about his family and we know that's kind of where he gets his inspiration from, but I wanted to kind of start out for all of you that may not know him as well as all of us here, I wanted to ask him, like, how is it that you come to these revelations, these, these scriptures, these passages through the anecdotal experiences of just what, what you live in as a father, as a husband, as a son, because that, that is just dripping in every single message you have. And for the viewers out there, I'd like them to kind of get a little insight as to how you come up with all this good stuff. Well, that's a very good question. So I guess to not take an hour on this, <laughs> <laughs> to simply say it is I've been in church my entire life. Um, and, you know, I think if we're being honest, we all start in church with mostly going to church with your family growing up, maybe. Maybe that's not your case. Maybe you're going on your own. Um, but for the most part, it's just like going somewhere that you have no point of reference for, you know, and it's, you're almost entering a club that you don't know, you know, not, not, a, not, a, not, not like a club, but like Definitely a, not a, a, social, a social club, you know. And, and you know, you're learning, you're learning lingo. So for the first, you know, 15 years of my life, I'm just being indoctrinated, for lack of a, a better term right now. Facts. Um, so first 15 years of my life, you know, we're, we're in church and we're, you know, learning as children, you know, law, teaching, anything, you know, you can go through all that. But I think for me, the moment that the rubber met the road is when I had a real life crisis. And that real life crisis was just being in middle school, uh, working out things internally, spiritually in my heart, feeling depressed, you know, normal feeling that a teenager would all teenagers probably feel. Mine was just a little more severe, um, and I thank God for that. But in that moment, um, it became real when I pulled over on the side of the road as a 16-year-old and pretty much had the moment like uh, the lady in the story from Matthew 15, the Canaanite woman, mm. um, where I'm broke, I'm, I'm empty, I don't have any reason to live, I don't have any reason to go forward. And I, I literally carved Jesus out, like like literally carved him in this culvert underneath the highway by myself and, and told him, you know, if you're real, if this is all real, if, if, if you've got a plan for me, then prove it because I don't feel you and I don't, I don't, I don't know anything like I thought I knew it. And one week later, I met Kristen. Mm. And, it, you know, we could just jump into that, but I won't. But... I'm, I'm happily married now for what what feels like just my whole life. <laughs> I mean, I got married when I was 18, so um, or 19. So you know, from that moment of desperation, I cried out to something that I I was hoping would be what I had learned in the first 15, 16 years of my life, and the real manifest presence of Jesus manifested through my wife in that convenience store and. 
that's just the foundation of where all this comes from. And now, and you know, now I know he's in all. He's all in all. He's in everything. He's in, in and then especially getting into the childlike. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote my phone number on the back. I think it was a Winston cigarette carton. Nice. Yeah, that was that was what I wrote my phone. And I think she wrote her phone number down on the back of an Orbit gum wrapper. I'll never forget that. Um, Those two go together pretty well. After yeah. a smoke, you probably want a piece of gum so you don't smell like Winston's it. Winston's right? and gum, you know. That's still that's still kind of how we live. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but but really, I think especially getting into the childlike, um, seeing that my children, our children, the children, all children have something that we don't have as adults, or we've lost. Better 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 said, um, and. I feel like they teach me more than I could ever learn or study or or seek out. So I guess the previous knowledge of knowing when, when it's got to happen right. and you really just, you're calling God, you're calling him out, you know, and I think he, he loves that, you know. Mm. Um, it's almost a put your money where your mouth is, <laughs> and, and he does. You know, that's, and people think that's, you know, sacrilege or whatever, but I feel like why are we doing any of this if you can't call him into your situation? I mean, if why are we studying all of this? Why are we trying to gain all this knowledge if it doesn't apply? If you can't apply it, if right. if 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 you're in a situation where I was as a teenager and you can't say I need help, and that's what the Canaanite woman did, help me. That's literally what she said. Yeah, help me, and he did, and that's my testimony. He did. He showed up in very manifest physical life so that is just how i process the gospel that's how i process my relationship with jesus how i process messages um don't ever think that god won't show up in a fortune cookie right <laughs> or the next silly thing that you think there's no way that he would show up through that because he, he absolutely does it's it's interesting that you put it kind of in that context with with the help me aspect of things because even my son uh, at two years old, he doesn't say hold me or my daughter would say hold you when she'd want to be picked up or done it or, or to play with, you know, come play with me. He's very he's very uh, concise with his language at this point, which is very different from his dad, uh, as as most of you know. But he says, help me. That's just what he says, it, whether it's playing dinosaurs or whether it's getting a hand out of the bathtub or it's getting a, a drink get of water <laughs> or wanting to get on the drums like he did Sunday. And, and, you know, while we're on that point, I think that's a, that's a good point because we all had had that discussion uh, about how children worship. And I think you made a really great point about the distraction that, that really ties into the anthropos that takes over the church where control would you would you like to expound on that yeah. while we're here <clears throat> yeah i mean you know from from the standpoint of adulthood or being a grown-up right when we come into a setting like a church most of us were raised you know i mean god bless everybody that you know that that believed that they were walking on quote unquote holy ground and i'm not saying you know we've talked about this before when when people dedicate their lives to building a building or having a space to worship and gather with people and all that stuff, that is a sacred thing. I, mean, I, I do believe that there is there is a, a sacred element to it. However, when we were called down over and over for running yep. around and just being kids, right, right. or uh, enjoying the worship service and dancing around and whatever, uh, you know, that that that's where Anthropos comes in, right? Um, and really, what it comes back to in my mind is uh, more of a jealousy or a covetousness mm. from the adult yeah. to say, you know, well, if I don't have the freedom to act like that, then they shouldn't be able to act like that. Right. Yeah. Or, and this, this kind of ties into, you know, on the psychological front, uh, there's a certain type of therapy that basically they utilize uh, what, what they call uh, a, it's, it's sort of a, a debt system, right? It's like, it's like your family builds debt over the generations, right? So, uh, in in other words, if your parents couldn't do something, the, a lot of times they feel like you shouldn't be able to do that. Or right. if you're going to do that, then you should have to earn your way into it, right? If your parents had to work while they were in school, well, bless God, you're going to work while you're in school, right? And so it becomes this sort of jealousy and then sort of, again, covetousness, almost wanting that 
And because they want it and because they're jealous of it, they're going to cut it off for you because if I can't have it, you can't have it. And, and we do that a lot in church. Um, but I think uh, as far as children and worship and that expression, it's like if you could just find, and, and you've talked about the childlike, but find your inner child that's ready and willing to express that mm -hmm. and disarm yourself of all those defenses that, that say, you know, how embarrassed you would be or how foolish you would look and, and so on and so forth. If you could just disarm those things and have that freedom, man, things would be a lot better. Or even the, I think this was something we talked about too, even the, the understanding of, of Saul being tortured by Stephen's death because of the freedom that Stephen had to stand and deliver one of the best messages and sermons in the New Testament. Yeah. And that, that creates in someone like a Saul who has all the education, who has had to earn it, who's sat at these seats and at these tables with these great leaders and great rabbis and has picked up all the lingo and knows all the different languages and is reading all the different translations to hear someone so free and really in their childlike just to stand and proclaim to a group of people that are going to discount you for the moment you start opening your mouth, but to see him do such an adequate and proficient job has to be some of the torture that he really faces that really pulls him towards his own experience with God himself. Uh, and, you know, I think that's something that, you know, your daughter Tegan is now coming up on the stage and she's playing the bongo drums and it just, it delights my heart credence. Uh, AJ's daughter, she's running up and down, bringing notes of love and affection, just enjoying the worship service. My son got on the bongo drums last Sunday and I was able to kind of just kneel with him and, and just kind of let him do that. And that's something that even in my own church experience did not happen. Uh, it was something where even as a young child in my, my grandfather's church, I got called down. Uh, my mother didn't like that. Uh, and now we have the opportunity as, as husbands and fathers ourselves to really kind of change the tide on that. And that, that's what I think we really get to with the dog people message with worship and that reciprocal adoration where you really kind of get into the conversation. And I'll let I'll let you pick that up because I know that's something you said you wanted to you wanted to run with unless you got something to jump in with right quick. Um, that reciprocal adoration that is likened to a kiss or a dog that licks the master's hands uh, that. That, to me, is what we're experiencing with the freedom we're allowing our children to have that we didn't have. We're not being jealous over it. In fact, it's leading me to be more free myself because the children will lead them, as we've talked about for months on end. Um, but when we talk about that, when you get into that concept of reciprocal adoration, Let's delve into that, and let's, let's jump in there both feet. Right. So I think the best way to kick it off would be, so what is worship to you? Um, that's the question. Is it the uh, now that's what I call worship albums that we had in the 90s with Michael W. Smith? Um, is it, you know, is that, is wow. that worship? Is it the wow or is it wow? Wow. Is it wow? That's what I call worship. Wow. Wow. That's what I call worship. So, um, so what is worship? Is it, is it obligation or adoration? Yeah. Um, because the first thing, um, the first thing that you try to do as a man, when you hear all these things is get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You try to get better at worship and, and work harder, study more, pray more, and do more, and then that becomes ob obligatory. Um, so I, so I, type, I typed a little bit out this morning that I think will, that'll, that'll help us here. Um, just this, this will kind of hit a little bit of all that I talked about Sunday, so give me just a quick three minutes here. So it was Anthropos that brought Gideon and Fotini, who was the woman at the well, into the mindset that they were in. Both of them tried to fathom God in the context of Anthropos, man's world. It was in which Anthropos, of course, we know is manhood. It means to be a man, literally. A man-faced being. Adulthood. Adulthood. For, for yep. all the ladies yes, that yep. are watching. Sorry. Um, 
So it was in this context that Jesus opened dialogue with the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. He opens dialogue in the same context, context that Fotini and Gideon are operating in, which is adulthood, manhood. So Jesus opens dialogue with the Canaanite woman in this realm, the natural anthropos realm. She decided to go to the spiritual realm on her own, mm. the childlike. Humiliation became exaltation, as we've heard from Hillel. Um, and making herself of no reputation, right. as Jesus does, mm. Abba's adoration for the true child was recovered in all three stories, which provoked reciprocated adoration. So how do we interpret this? Because Anthropos will tell you to fight for the head seat of the table. Mm -hmm. Worship better, pray harder, sacrifice more, live purer than the rest, focus hard on worshiping. That is not adoration. Right. That's obligation. Yeah. That's trying to achieve worship through the same broken formula and mindset that landed you in the depression in the first place. Adoration realized translates you into the true eternal realm of now, mm, which is reality, yes. the present. In reality, with Abba's adoration, we are able to see the way out of darkness, which 1 Corinthians 10.13 says there's no temptation that's tempted you but that which is common to man. Mm -hmm. And if he would, and common to Anthropos. Yeah, right. So if he's, if he's given, if there is a temptation, he's provided a way of escape. And that way of escape is in the present. So we become, we become bold and courageous, yes. crumb sniffing, hand licking servants of our master. Mm. Not puffed up, head seat of the table hunters going through the motions of obligation. Servitude becomes our goal. Now servitude makes Anthropos vomit. The literal word of servitude, yeah. it, it makes a little bit of vomit come up for man. Right. You know? Yeah. Why would I serve? Why would I why would I be a servant? If I'm if I'm if I'm this guy. Ownership yeah. versus servitude. Yeah. If I'm the if I if I'm the big dog, right. then why should I it's exactly why the disciples wanted to send the, the Canaanite woman home. Wouldn't that be significant that the common use of slavery throughout all of history, all of time, and all of civilizations would be such a revolting idea and concept yeah. to those that actually do become enlightened? Right. It's yeah. that they don't get to own anything. You right. just get to work and you just get to serve. And in that aspect of mm. slavery that every culture has mm. been involved in, mm. That becomes the common oh, yeah. understanding or the common use mm. of man's authority when they're seeking mm. the head of the table. Man. And we've seen that in our own country. Yeah. And we've overcome that and are still overcoming that to this day. That's great. That's a great tie-in. Because how does how does worship look for you? Well, how does how does slavery look in third world countries? Yeah. Um, is that how your spiritual mind works? Because for a lot of people it is. You become this slave that is not going to, to work because you are adored. You're going to work because you have to go to work to be accepted. Well, acceptance has already been given at the cross. Mm. You've, already been, you've already been accepted. You've already been approved. You've already been sealed. So there's nothing that you have to go earn to be better. Now it becomes servitude for everybody. It's servitude that leads us, it's, and that's why the children lead us, because the children are the most apt to serve. Yeah. The dog is the most apt to obey the commands of the master, not because they're, they're afraid that the master doesn't like them, but because the master has the treats. The master has the love. The master has the adoration for them, and it's a reciprocated adoration. So it's your child that's always asking. Not, it doesn't matter what it is. If I'm at home, and here we go again with the real-life yeah. comparisons, but this is Jesus, man. So you're sitting at home, and I'm sitting there, and, and I realize I'm watching TV, and I realize my glasses are a little smudgy. I'll, I'll say, uh, Malachi, I want you to run in the bathroom there because, I'm, you know, I've been at work all day. I just got settled in, got this recliner just perfect. <laughs> um, it's, it's just at the right level, the, the degree. Uh, it's all, it's, the angle's perfect. Um, son, why don't you go grab me a, a tissue so I can clean this smudge off my glasses? And then... Credence and Melody knock him down getting to the bathroom right. yeah, yeah, yeah. to bring me the t That's Jesus. Yeah. That's servitude. That's and it's not because they want Daddy to love them more because Daddy can't love them more. It's because they love Daddy. Right. 
And there's nothing more than that. if I can make Daddy happy right now by going and getting him this yeah. toilet paper out of the bathroom to clean his glasses so he can watch the Braves, yeah. then this is what we're going to do. So, so I think that's Kairos. I think yes, that's, they that's see the a now. moment and they seize it. Yeah. In that moment. Yeah. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Yeah, this. and it's going to be me. That's, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get it. You know? So just to finish that out, servitude, let's see, uh, servitude is fun for children and dogs, which I hit. We find God in the crumbs in the leftovers of society. Anthropos never comes down here to the floor, to the, ta- to the, to the floor. Yeah. Worship, man never comes to the floor. Worship isn't even at the table. It's in the fort. It's in the clothes rack at Belk, under the church pews, under the dinner table, on the floor, on the earth. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it's just, just to bring it all into, into, into context here. There's this big table that we're all trying to sit at, and that's where the disciples were really gunning for when they're in dialogue with Jesus. Especially James and John, as we've talked about. Yeah, and here comes this woman who has a real issue. Yeah, and mom. Who has a real issue. Her daughter is possessed. Her daughter is very, very unwell. And she comes in, and she says, it doesn't matter what they want. I want you because you have my healing. It's what I did when I pulled it. so divine that you asked me that how all this comes about for me. How does all this work? How does all this become real? Because I had that moment, and he showed up in the body of my wife. Jesus himself manifested as Kristen, at that time, Kristen Michelle Loveless. And I knew that that was, that was, that was my better half. That was the one. So She wouldn't stay Loveless for long. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Punny. Little that punny. Was, that was really funny. <laughs> I loved it. I'm laughing inside. If I can if I can jump over here because there's there's the aspect of Matthew 15 that you brought out Brent. I thought was very important to talk about which was I wanted to ask you about uh, the historical Jewish context with which Jesus referred to the lost in Matthew 15. Yeah. Cuz that's that's something that when you had talked to when you we had talked about that I thought was just a brilliant catch in what he's really saying about the Jewish people and about the lost people that he sent to save. Because he he tells them, and you you pointed out really beautifully on Sunday, when they the woman says, uh, you know, worships at that point, or before she comes down to worships, he says that to the disciples because he doesn't answer her word, and then says that I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And it, it almost implies necessarily that she's got it figured out. That I wasn't sent to her. Right. I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel oh. because they are the ones. And he's, he lives in a very Jewish context, living in the Jewish backdrop. God could have chosen to send the Christ, and, I'm, and he did, if you listen to anything else that we've preached. Right. But God chose Christ, multiple different Christ, but it chooses Jesus Christ is sent into that particular time period, the Roman occupation of Judea, Israel, all of those tribes together, and as they still have the diaspora, they're they're dispersed across the Middle Eastern area, and and, and determining whether they're going to make their way back home or not. He uses their law, he uses their religion, yeah. and uses their belief system and the structure that it was placed within to save them as being lost. Mm. And part of it, too, is Josh has talked about this. We talked about it before, about the myths of Baal and Yom. Yeah. And how there's nothing in those myths about child sacrifice. There's nothing in there about killing children. Right. But Jezebel, you pointed out very well, that Jezebel, in that very place, where this miracle is taking place, that that's where Jezebel institutes Baal worship. And the way that they instituted Baal worship was a statue with hands like this, and they killed children. And here's a woman, not begging for herself. Right. She's not asking for herself. Yeah. She's asking to save a child. Mm. She's got it figured out. Mm. She's got the way yeah. right in front of her. The right says, side up view, exactly. finally, in that place. That's been used yes. and utilized for the upside down yes. view of things. Finally becomes redeemed. Yeah through the person of Jesus Christ and through this woman who had such great faith. That's right. Man, that's good. She wants to save 
her child right. wants to save life. And then here's Jesus saying, you know, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then ask that question, you know, do we give the children's bread to the dogs? As this is after she's worshipped. And the word worship that you pointed out, it means to lick the, lick the hand like a dog. Proskuneo. And how she's saying that even the dogs lick the crumbs from the master's table. And it's, it's that same thing that you're saying. It's the, the Eleutherios of James 1, where it says the perfect law of liberty. It's being like a child. Because children will not just usually, not at least my kids don't, I don't know about everybody else, but they, won't, they just won't accept the final, this is my final answer. Right. And Tegan did it Sunday. She does it uh, almost every time. But it was Sunday. They didn't have to go to school on, well, they're out of school now. Sunday night, can I go to, can I go to Emily's house? And I spend the night with Emily. I'm like, all right, you haven't even asked anybody. I don't even know if Emily's invited you. It's just, you just, you're just assuming that you're going to do it. I was like, no, we've got, we got this tomorrow. You're doing this. Well, can I just, can I just go? No, we're, we're doing this. Well, can I just, and ask over and over, Tegan, stop it. You, she's not going to stop, and that's exactly what she does. She's doing it, not for, and not for her own sake, not for her own joy, but it's for l- giving life to her child. And she's not going to let this moment pass her and say that, yeah, I might be a dog, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And your faith, that's what he says, your faith. Yeah. Is, is going to give you exactly what you asked for. It's going to give you exactly what you wanted. So it's this belief in this. It's unknown whether it's going to happen or not. Right. But the faith to say that I'm going to try it anyway. I'm going to go anyway. Very much like Gideon, who he does his math, and God keeps doing his math. Yeah. He starts out with, what, 30,000, whatever it is, drops down to 300, and they're facing an army of 300,000, if I'm not mistaken. And God's math is completely different than Gideon's math and cuts it down. But then you're saying, you know, asking God to enter into our predicaments. Right. Asking God, inviting him into our real life stories. And that's what Gideon does. Well, what if I lay this this sheep's rug out here? Like, would you prove it to me then? Would, yeah. What if there's dew on this and not on that? I want to, I'm inviting God into my predicament, into my fear. Invite right. God into my faithlessness and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it leads you to that place where you're, you know that he'll involve himself. Yeah. That God has involved himself with mankind. And I've been in Romans 8 a lot this week. But it, leading up to that in Romans 7, he asked, who can deliver me from this body of death? And I think about this when you talk about Anthropos. I think about that passage. So I went back and read it this week out of Romans 7. Who can deliver me from this body of death? And one of the commentaries said that it was uh, very much a old practice where someone that a ruler or whatever the, whoever was in charge would want to put a dead body on a living body, on a man's body, and he would have to walk around with this dead body until whatever it was that killed the dead guy enters into his body and kills him. Mm. And that's what Paul is most likely referencing. Who's going to deliver me from this dead body I'm carrying around constantly? Mm. Because you have this juxtaposition of spirit and flesh that's in Romans 8. That is a little bit misconstrued anyway. But this this juxtaposition of spirit walking by the spirit and walking by the flesh. Well, who's going to deliver me from the thing that's already dead? Right. That I, who's going to deliver me from the thing that is, it's going to, it's going to, infect me and it's going to kill me if i keep walking around with that but living like what you're saying what you're what you're saying about this woman that comes out here i'm not going to live the the death i'm not going to live the death life i'm not going to live the body of death i'm going to live the life i'm going to believe in the life and invite jesus into my situation and believe that i'm going to live my child's going to live things are are going to take place but it's it's with that mindset that idea of the worship like a like a dog, a pack yeah. animal, you know. Yeah. And you can't you can't get away from that love. It's so genuine and so real and so true. And it's they're very much pack animals, and they they yeah. see you as their family, see you as part of them. Yeah. And seeing ourselves that way and worship, what does that what does that place in our mind when we are worship? If if your idea of worship is singing songs, and in that song, is it a, a way to make yourself feel better or, or right. whatever it is, or is it that you're really feeling that I'm a part of God yeah, 
and it, God's a part of me. Because there was even on uh, CT Magazine, they had a video, and it was kind of, it was just, a, you know, a parody video of, of worship, these two guys, there's two girls doing worship, and, and um, you know, it was like, have we changed what it means to worship? And I just actually just thought of it when you started talking about it. I didn't, th- if I, I thought about it earlier, I would have sent it to you, but just now thought of it. So, but they asked that question, and it's, it's really the idea is if, if worship is leading us to a place of where the worship leader is the ego-centric person. Right. And it's about their ministry and their songs and them. Then you've not pointed them to Jesus. You've pointed right. them to your performance. Right. But when you take it and you say that worship is your connection to God, letting you know that you are connected to God mm-hmm. and that He's connected to you, and you can invite Him right in the middle of all of your fears and all of your situations and everything that's going on in your life, and that's what it is to me. And I, I think too. It, we talked about this a little bit, too. I think the tie-in that, that you made or the connection you made with the last prophecy of Malachi also rings true with what Jesus says in Matthew 15, which is his prophecy, Malachi's prophecy, was that the that they had lost their way. They, they, had, they had strayed. And you, the, other, the other little tie-in here is in this place, this Canaanite woman is going to know who Jezebel is. She's going to know about the Phoenician gods. She's going to know about the Babylonian gods. She's going to know about Ashtaroth and Ishtar, the consorts of Baal. She's going to understand the significance of asking for this miracle in this place. And I think that's where when, when Jesus identifies such great faith in her, it, it made me think about uh, the multiple times in the series The Chosen where Jesus' response to someone that is asking for a miracle or coming adamantly and requesting something of him is that your faith is beautiful. There's something beautiful about your faith. It's that, it's that real. You're not one of the lost ones. You're something else. You're a friend. And then on that, and, and this is where I'll jump in, on that proskuneo, it's, it's also a kiss. So when we talk about that type of adoration where my mind goes to in multiple contexts, like what you were saying, in the Gnostic belief of how do I get rid of this dead body? Well, the Gnostics believe that's through the physical death that you are then returned to the Pleroma. And Jesus didn't need a dead body attached to him to complete his mission, but he did need a way of deliverance made. And he chooses Judas. He chooses one of us to make the way to deliver him from the body of death, to return back to the play Roma with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And how does Judas do that? He delivers his master with a kiss. He comes in and he serves. Because like we talked about when we went through that series, is this is not an easy thing to ask of anyone. I am the Messiah, and I am asking you to deliver me into the hands of Anthropos who only seek to kill me and snuff me out. And as a servant with childlike faith to believe who Jesus was, to not be one of the lost ones among the disciples, to not be confused in the moment, but to know full well who he's dealing with, who he's talking to, and what he's being asked then to follow that up on, on the heels of that with this reciprocal adoration and that proskuneo, meaning a kiss, which is to lick the master's hand. And what do you think Judas is doing in that last moment? He's getting that last little bit of love. He's getting that last little bit of energy. He's getting that last little bit of intimacy before the master leaves. And it's just like, just like dogs when you have them in real life. Is they're excited whether you've been gone five minutes or five hours. They're ready to come, jump all over you, lick your hands, lick your face, get in your ear holes. They're just all over you. And I think in that moment, that's more akin to what the story of Judas is really telling us happened in the garden is it's not some betrayal as Anthropos would have chosen to believe and Anthropos would have chosen to indoctrinate all of us to believe but it's the servant of the master 
who has the last opportunity to see his master before he goes and does what he knows he's purposed and destined to do. And he delivers Jesus of the dead body. He delivers him into the hand of Anthropos with that kiss, with that last moment of intimacy. And then we, we pulling that back to the Canaanite woman with this such great faith, in this place of child murder and child sacrifice, having the faith to go in there and continue to ask for this miracle has such significance. And you were talking about the significance of, of the Canaanite woman in our discussion too, so I'll I'll throw that over to you to pick that up. Yeah. So the the thing that <clears throat> excuse me the thing that stood out to me was yeah uh, at the beginning of Matthew fifteen Jesus is or these these Pharisees come and and scribes lawmakers or whatever, whatever not not lawmakers but interpreters of the law they come and they question Jesus about his disciples and they're like why why don't your disciples follow the rules and wash their hands before they eat and he's like well why don't you follow the rules and love your mother and father like you're supposed to because you say you honor your mother and your father but when they're in financial need you give that to god and you call it worship or you call it a sacrifice to god all the while you're rejecting your parents the people that you're supposed to be serving and loving right right uh helping out in the time of need whatever the case may be so you're a bunch of hypocrites yeah. and then the disciples are like yo jesus don't you know that you offended them and he's like yeah i do i'll be bussing bussing you know <laughs> and uh <laughs> he said he said uh then we got no real uh no he got <laughs> He said, he said, don't, don't worry about them. Basically, he said, just forget about them. You got enough to worry about on your own. And, and, he, and he tells them like a little parable or riddle almost. He's like, every, uh, every plant that my father has not planted will be, will be uprooted. And Peter comes to him, which is just like Peter, right? And he's like, hey, can you explain that riddle that you told us earlier? And Jesus <laughs> says, I love how the NIV says, are you so dull <laughs> Are you still so dull? <laughs> so wow, Peter, you're being really dense right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so he's like, he's like, uh, seriously, like I got to explain this to you. And he he goes on to tell him that the Pharisees are blind leaders of the blind, right? They're they're just just let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. Um, and he he finishes that that passage there in Matthew 15 verse 17 he says do you not yet understand whatsoever enters into the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the sewer but those things which proceed out of the mouth are from the heart and they defile the man for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders adulteries fornications thefts false witnesses blasphemy I mean the list goes on right of all the terrible things that can come out of our heart right Jeremiah 17 the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, is what he says. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these things, these things are those that defile a man. Not what, not what you eat, not when you eat with unwashed hands. And then the next thing that happens is here comes this Canaanite woman. So all, all in this, it's leading up to. And I thought about it when I said something earlier today. I thought about it for for a while because I was like, was Jesus trying to set them up, you know, to shame them? And it's like, no. Because a good father wouldn't do that, right? I mean, look, I, I love embarrassing my kids, but, you know, not, not shaming them, right? Like, I, I don't mind embarrassing them, but that, that's yes. different, right? Uh, so, so, you know, he, he's not going to set them up for, for failure, right? Uh, he's not going to set them up in this moment to, to shame them, make them feel worthless, feel like a piece of garbage or whatever. But he is setting them up for a moment of metanoia, a moment of repentance. Or he was setting them up for the moment to call her in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, they failed at that one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I get saying. I get saying. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, they missed the they missed the shot, shot right or missed the mark. Yeah, they want to send her away. Right. And Jesus, Jesus continues to allow her to you know do her thing right and come forward. But it's and it, and they, they, he goes through all that. He he quotes the law like you said. He 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 gives all the and she even agrees with it. She's like, yeah, you're right. I am a dog, yeah. but, and then he's, he, you know, kills it, right, with the, man, your, your faith is beautiful. Your right. faith is great. And now they're left in this, oh, my gosh, wow moment. Yeah. Holy cow. I, we should not have been thinking about this like that 
we should have been thinking about it the way that Jesus was thinking about it. That this woman's coming with great faith, not that she's annoying me. So in the middle or in the midst, another way of saying it would be in the midst of their prejudice, their bias, yep. their hatred, yep. their anthropos, she becomes the very light, the oh, yeah. very being of illumination that illuminates their understanding and does so even at the challenge of Jesus. I think he's challenging her more than he's challenging the disciples. I think he understands full well and this also comes from the context of Judas, they don't get it yet. They, they think they get it, and they're, they're willing to follow, but they still have their preconceived notions of who he is and what he's going to do and how this is all going to turn out. And with her, it's like, I have to challenge you because the brighter your light gets, yeah. the more this darkness gets dispelled. Yeah. The more this bias and prejudice gets worn out of them and they need that because it's still there it's still present and as as many scriptural references say you know the light is or the spirit of man is the candle of the lord we we talked about that you get to revelation i believe it's is it 21 or 22 it might be might be a little bit of both where the celestial bodies that exist there's no need for a sun there's no need for a moon there's no need for any artificial light you become the very light that illuminates your world. And I think in this instance, we're seeing an echo of where we're supposed to go, where the kingdom is supposed to be in this faithful Canaanite woman. And I think it's it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, she becomes one of the enlightened ones, which is you went yes. to St. Patini at the well, and that's, that's what her name means, the enlightened one, or enlightened, the enlightened, which is full of light. Potini, yeah. She was baptized by the by the disciples, and that's when she got her name. Yep, like Potas, yeah. And John John would say that life was the light of men as well. So, you know, we have all of these scripture references. We have we have these conversations, but I think that's that's why we're trying to do things in this kind of style and format, because there's so many different areas that we can get into. Yeah, go ahead. This is a good point to bring up while we're here. Uh, Pastor brought this up after the service, um, but in the Gideon story, yeah. um, the significance, and you, you talked about it too, of the, the jar, the empty jar with the flame in it, with the torch in it, when that jar breaks, mm -hmm. it took the breaking of that jar for the light yeah. to expound upon the earth. Mm -hmm. And then when that jar broke, the Midianite army was done. They were running, right. literally running. So the things that may be encompassing you about or, or surrounding you or, or terrifying you, the things that keep you awake at night, if you break the jar that tells you you're empty, if you decide to break the jar or leave the water pot behind or to push through this judgment that says you're not welcome yeah. and say, I'm going to bust this jar, this preconceived notion of who I am, and when you bust that jar, the light comes out of the jar that everybody else says is empty that everybody else says you need to go home. You become the one that is bringing light to every situation you walk into, and the, ar and the army's on the run. <laughs> I mean, the, the things that you're afraid of are literally running from you now. I think it was Leonard Cohen, the one that wrote the Hallelujah song. Yeah. That he's the one that said uh, something about thanking God for broken vessels or cracked ones because that's how the light gets in anyway is the, through all the cracks. Mm -hmm. So if you were able to break that emptiness, like you're saying, and let go of that emptiness. I think in in the church too, we've we've done a, a poor job, and it's it's not always that. I don't want to just blame the church as a whole as a blanket statement because we've done with what we've been given, right? And we sort of had a little bit of that conversation, and um, you know something that again, like so I was in Romans eight this week and last week, and came across something because and really because I read it out of Francois's Bible, out of the Mirror Bible. And says that how in Romans 8 and 1 where it says that you know, now there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In the King James Version, it adds another portion to that. It says to those who walk by the, those who walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. We'll come to find out that's not in the original codex. Mm. It's not there. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> so, well, one thing that I read that and out of Francois' commentary, and I was like, how did you even know that? How did you even find that? And so I, I could have called him. But I was like, I don't, 
I guess I could have, but I didn't. I wanted to find it myself. I don't know. I just I'm kind of dumb like that. But anyway, I wanted to find it myself. So I went on the journey and I started it through. Uh, eventually, lo- very long story short, was able to get connected to someone that has access to Princeton Theological's library and Wycliffe library, and was able to get two. I, I ended up today was the one for the Vaticanus. So there's the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Codex Sinaiticus, which are the two oldest codexes of Greek language that the Bible, the New Testament, was based off of. And when you read those original texts, that it does not have that. It doesn't say. It just says that you get from Romans 7, who can deliver me from this body of death. But do you mean people have been adding to yeah. and taking away from yeah. the Scriptures from the beginning? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I'll give them a little bit of credit because they, when they get to the Textus Receptus, that's what the King James is based off. It's based right. off a, a Latin version of the Geneva Bible and the Textus Receptus. It has that in there, and it's in that original copy. But as copyists began to write it down out of the Alexandrian Codex, the Bizet Codex, the Sinaiticus, the Vaticanus Codex, they read these passages and they think, well, this, verse 4, belongs up here. So we're going to copy verse 4 and copy it to the bottom of this. And then so once you get to the Textus Receptus that has all these added things to it, they think, well, we've got a more complete copy. Because, you know, these other codecs, they don't have that. It's like, oh, maybe we should have gone back to those older ones because that's closer to the source anyway. So maybe instead of thinking that, it's like, let's keep the the one with all the additions. But when you read it out of Romans 8, and it's, to me, man, I've just been, oh, man, I've, uh, it's just been driving me crazy, but uh, just because of, of this. So even if you read it in the NRSVA, it doesn't have it in there. But in the King James, you know, it would say, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The King James says to those who walk by the flesh and not after, and walk by the Spirit and not in the flesh. Mm. But then he says, for the law of the Spirit of life, it does, it adds a condition. It adds a condition. It adds, it adds an obligation right off the bat. Yeah. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit so he's making it sound in verse 4 a lot different than what it would sound like in verse 1 that verse 1 sounds like i have a choice Verse 1 sounds like there's a dead body still strapped to me from Romans 7. Yeah. So if you read in context from Romans 7 to Romans 8, and even if you go back to Romans 5 and 6, where he's letting them know that the trespass of one man was able to universally and permanently cause decay and corruption on all of mankind. Mm. And it's very easy for us to believe in the work of Adam. But it's less easy for the church now to believe that the work of Christ was just as powerful and just as significant. Mm. It is so easy to say that what Adam did was permanent and universal, but it's not easy for us to say that what Jesus did was permanent and universal. Oh, man, I feel like speaking in tongues. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. But it's it's easy for us to believe that because, for one, the misguidance of a of a chapter 8 verse 1 that says those who walk by the flesh have the spirit because you could you walk by the flesh and he does say mortify the deeds of the flesh mortify the actions do the things that you the things that you shouldn't do don't do those but don't do it from the perspective of obligation Mm -hmm. and don't do it from the perspective of thinking that you're a flesh being you are a spirit being because if you read it in first corinthians i can't remember the, the exact chapter now but he says we know no man no more we don't know man by the flesh and that's not anthropos, it's oedo, it's just humanity. We don't know humanity by the flesh, we know them by the spirit. And when you read it in Galatians, he'll say, you are no more flesh, you are spirit. Right. So if we are to believe the consistency, of, at least of Paul's message, because yeah. Paul, the Bible is not a univocal thing, it's, it's an anthology written of multiple different authors of their specific walk with God. It doesn't speak univocally, but Paul at least speaks univocally and says, that you are no more flesh, you are spirit, that what Christ did was so universal and so permanent that it delivered you from carrying around the dead body. Now that dead body is not going to infiltrate your living body. You will not die from the same disease of death flesh 
Now you can live in the Spirit because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and that's, where I think, that's where I think it becomes more difficult in understanding what Jesus did and what he accomplished. What I think becomes more difficult is to then go back and say, oh, it's the fall of Adam that corrupted all men. Yeah. Because here's, here's what we have to believe. If we are spirit, yeah. embodying in flesh, yeah. to me, the divine authority that you have is going to be to deliver. Mm-hmm. It's going to be to save. Mm-hmm. It's going to be to change the worldview from upside down to right side up. Anthropos doesn't carry that kind of authority. That dead body we've been carrying around and blaming Adam and Eve for all of our ills is just another scapegoat of the religious to tie it to someone else's mistake, someone else's error, someone else's misstep, and because of them, now you are tempted in all points. But that's that's harder to believe when you do get into the univocal expression that Paul makes that we are spirit and everything Jesus did eliminates any idea of carrying around any more dead bodies to be delivered from this flesh. You can't unbreak the jar. You can't unbreak. Right. Once it's broken. It's broken. That emptiness is broken. Yeah, you can't you can't unring the bell is what I normally say, but you can't, you can't unbreak the jar. And that's what Hebrews says. Is do we crucify him afresh? Yeah. Right. No, he was crucified, and he literally yeah. says it in Hebrews once and for all. Yep. It's where the three musketeers got it. It's all. like once and for all. It's yep. uh, or, or all for all one or whatever one. one, 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 one for, yeah, exactly. Catch your pants before they fall. It was. <laughs> 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 that's what it is. That's that's where it's from. Yeah. It's, he did it once and for all. Yeah. It was once for, and all literally means all. Yeah, I got told this week by saying that 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 was terrible exegesis. I was really? Like, I said, yeah, that that was that all means all. And that's all all means. I said it was terrible exegesis. I was like, oh, I said that's fine. I said I didn't actually do the exegesis on this. Uh, Alexandria of Clement did it. Uh, Origen, yeah. uh, Saint uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus did it. Yeah, like, <laughs> Paul, I didn't, I didn't actually have to do the exegesis on this. Yeah. It was done by multiple other. It was done by followers. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. and and you know well, even the even the name. So we we say Adam and Eve as if there were two people in the beginning. Yes, go ahead. So so but the name Adam in the English is just the Hebrew word Adam, right. which means humanity. Right. That's all it is. Right. That's all it is. So we, we capitalize the letter. We, we put the name on it. And we say, yep, that guy, oh, man, that dude, Adam, he's just a piece of dirt, right? <laughs> just a hunk of dirt. Uh, he's worthless. You know, he's done all this stuff to, to get us in this predicament. But the truth is, it's just humanity. Right. And it's like you're saying, you know, we all we all are born into anthropos, right? Yes. But but that is the key, right? We are born into it. So that means we came from somewhere else. We were existing somewhere else, doing something else, right? And so it's like we're at, we are these heavenly creatures. We're these celestial beings that are having an earthly experience, not the other way around. We're not earthly beings having a spiritual experience. It's the other way around. We're spiritual, spiritual creatures. And humanity, when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that is the beginning of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning of understanding the dichotomy of divine and physical being that you are. And it is two separate things. Yep. Now, those they're put into one house. That, that physical house is where you're put into. Yeah. But you're not just this physical representation yeah, right. of who you are. Yeah. You are something much greater. And, um, oh, what's his name? We were talking about him. Uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, he, he said, if, if you were to see every being in their real form in their divine form it would move you to fall to your knees and worship them because of the glory you would see that's embodied inside this flesh but because they've used those words for humanity and turned them into names and identities you now identify a scapegoat which eliminates or is the beginning of eliminating personal responsibility, which abdicates your 
free will to then do what Jesus was showing us all to do. Uh, I have personal responsibility. I've been tempted in all points, yet have not missed the mark. And because of that, I have not abdicated my free will to be divine in this physical space and change the game forever. And that's why I think Jesus tells the disciples, greater works will you do? If you ever catch hold of what I'm really showing you here, and you ever let go of the Torah's stranglehold on the scapegoat of an Adam and an Eve, which, of course, also doesn't make sense because when Cain kills Abel, he's marked, so no one else will kill him. But if we believe those are the only four people alive on the planet, <laughs> yeah, exactly. who's God sparing him from? I'm just, that's just that's, a, that's another point it's a right pet there. Peeve but if, if, you, of if, mine. if you had opened up a book, if you opened up one of Wyatt's books, and in the second page of the book, a snake is talking, would you take that as scientific or would you take that as figurative or metaphorical? Metaphorical. Exactly. Meta- obviously metaphorical. And my, my son ha- has an affinity for snakes for some reason. He likes those slithering things. Uh, so if I saw that, I'd be like, okay, his imagination's running a little wild. He's seeing things in a, in a serpentine pattern, I suppose. But that's, that, I, it's such a beautiful point to make because it doesn't, you can't make physical sense or fact out of what's being said. You have to see it in the psychological. You have to see it in the spiritual. You have to see it in the emotional context of what the story is really saying. And what, what we're really supposed to gather from that is that we're all equal here. We're all going to be tempted here. It's not eating a fruit. It's not like, you know, these iPhone conspiracies that the bitten apple is the forbidden fruit and the I stands for the eye of the Antichrist that's always watching and always listening to you. One, how do you even know the fruit was an apple? We don't know that. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What what tree is that? Because Steve Jobs hallucinated on acid. Yeah, all. well, all right. Well, sometimes you can get some real religious enlightenment from that, and other times you wind up with stupid ideas like that. So it's a risk. <laughs> you know, do that. Do that in your personal life sparingly is what I would recommend in that. But that, that's where we just get to this, like you were saying, that's where we get to this moment where it's like, oh, man, it – if we put things in the proper context, then what we're really capable of is not what an Adam or an Eve did that changes the whole world, just terraforms all of creation and existence. All of God's plans get flushed by these two physical beings eating of a tree. Or that was never the story that was supposed to be told consciousness leads us to our understanding and to the path of remembering who we are and the moment we begin to see and that jar gets broken then we're given the opportunity to live as the divine in this world and change things for the divine and for the good for the light and that that life was the light of men yeah and to that point the so the it's the tree of the knowledge right, right. so the fruit is knowledge right. <laughs> but it's the tree of the knowledge of good the the and evil part is is also added yeah. so it's just the 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 tree of the knowledge of good now if i know of good then i also must know of evil right Correct. so it's just sort of it's sort of assumed right but but it's the tree of the knowledge of good that's that's the fruit that you're eating yeah uh, so I want to get back to, because I I think the tie-in from Matthew 15 and Judges 6 is, one, I've never heard it before. I've never never heard someone put those two, you know, that that situation, that miracle in the New Testament with this Old Testament story of Gideon. Uh, How did did you make that connection, or what what brought you to that connection? So the tie-in was, what brought me there was the dogs, um, the lapping the lapping I, I just to be honest i searched dog throughout throughout the scripture and saw and then saw that lapping in in judges and then i the more i read the story i'm like oh my god and then i saw the the jar part and then the uh the flame part and i'm like well that's patini and then it's like is that you god and it's like <laughs> yeah it's me it's me but um so gideon so gideon's story starts um 
at the wine press. And I yeah. misspoke Sunday when I said Gideon was sitting under the tree. I misspoke. It was the angel of God that sat under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, Gideon's dad. Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. So, all right, so this is brand new. This is brand new. This is, well, it's not. It's new to me. It's new to y'all. So for him to be threshing meat, uh, threshing, threshing wheat in the wine press, it means that the vineyards were plundered by the Midianites. Mm -hmm. So there weren't any grapes left. Right. Else the wine press wouldn't be empty for Gideon to flail his wheat. The Bible records that the land of Israel was so plundered that Israel was greatly impoverished. The Midianites would invade the land each harvesting season as a swamp of locusts, and together and together with the Amalekites and other tribes of the east, they'd devastate the entire place. So for Gideon to be in the wine press to thresh wheat is proof of the absence of any surviving vineyards in the land. The enemies didn't even bother to go to the wine press to check if there was anyone making wine because they were sure no one would be there given the absence of the grapes. So, wow at the symbolism of our lives. <laughs> yeah. if, if that's where I was at 16 years old, man, I was, I was in a culvert underneath a road, underneath Stroop Road in Foster, North Carolina. You can go to that spot. I'll take you there. I'll show you. I'll show you where it happened. Like that, that's where, that's where you find him. Like that's where, at the base of who you, and we talk about these crumbs being on the floor. Well, how would you not find God at rock bottom? Right. How would you not find him at the very bottom when there's no more grapes, there's no more wine, there's nothing here. I'm threshing wheat at a place that there's supposed to be wine. I, my life is not what I thought it would be. And that's when, when Gideon, when he says, I want you to go, Gideon, get it. I'm with you, mighty warrior. Yeah, Man, I'm threshing wheat in a wine press. Yeah. I'm not mighty. Me? Are you talking about me? And then God faces him directly, and this is the tie-in here. God faced him directly. Go in this strength that is yours. Yeah. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? Gideon said to him, my, me, my master, how and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the run of the litter. But here it is. And here's the Christ tie-in. God said to him, I'll be with you. Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. So there's your one. There's right. there's the all. And, and, and Lauren, Lauren put in the comments a minute ago that this was a universal love. This was right. this was complete. I, we, we'll go back and, and get her comment just right. But I, I kind of glimpsed at it up there. But this this thing that Christ did, this eternal salvation is complete and universal. And, it, and that's the significance of God going directly through Gideon. And it's like, man, you may feel like you just have nothing at all going right nothing's going right your life's not what you thought it would be you're in the perfect spot for a miracle you're in the perfect atmosphere for a miracle it's just like on a summer day when it's been hot and you know that the thing's just right and the moisture's just right and you're like everybody that's got any 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 wits about them's like there's going to be a storm tonight yep uh, I saw the sky this morning. It got really hot. It's going to be stormy. Well, when when you're in it, when you're in a dry spell, and your life's pretty, the the heat levels turn really high. Like you, you're 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 in a spot. It's time for the rain to come. So be ready. Be ready and be willing. And don't don't overlook something very simple because it's in those little simplistic things. Yeah, I was going to say, be on the lookout, right? Yeah. I mean, like like the servant of Elijah, you know, yeah. go and look. Yeah. Go and look. Well, I or, see a cloud about the size like, of a man's hand. Yeah, or be like the, the, the 300 men. That That's lap it. the water like That's the good. dog. That's good. So 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 up. so you're you're circumspect even in the act of going, and when you're you're thirsty, your soul is just totally. I'm thirsty. We're so thirsty. Well, you'll know the ones that you need to pick by the ones that go down there and lap it like a dog. Because for them to lap it like a dog, they're going to have to be circumspect. They're going to have to be looking around. They're still expecting something to happen. Everybody else is just diving straight for the water. Everybody else is just jumping for the head seat of the table. There's reflection in that. Yeah, that yeah, makes yeah. it yeah. where it truly is. By the waters of reflection, my soul is restored. Mm. They're actually doing the work of reflecting in the water. If you're just burying your face in it, and we do that. We bury our face in our bias. We bury our face in our prejudice. We bury our face in everything that we've been taught. 
We bury our face in our history. We bury our face in our culture. We bury our face in our races. We bury our face in our sexes. We bury our face in our job. We bury our fa- I mean, I could keep going on. You have to stop me. We bury our face in everything, and you lose the ability to have a moment of reflection, to be circumspect, and see my true self, to see what he says in, in Psalm 23. By the waters of reflection, my soul is restored. That's what he says. My soul is restored, and I know who I am by looking into the mirror, by looking into the water. And it's the the man in James that says he looks into the mirror and he looks into the perfect law of liberty. Do you remember who you are? Do you see your genesis? And do you continue in that beginning? Do you continue in that genesis? Because one of the other comments you put up there was one from a a book that we've read from Rain Wilson, who was the guy from The Office, he was Dwight from The Office, wrote a fantastic book called Soul Boom. And he is a, he, he uh, is a, believer of the Baha'i faith, which is sort of a combination of lots of different beliefs, but it's Persian uh, based at, from a few hundred, few hundred years ago. But it was something that he comments in there, and I forget who it actually says the, the statement, but it says that we're spiritual beings having a, 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 an earthly experience, yeah. that we're not you know, human beings. Mm-hmm. We are spiritual beings having right. a, an earthly experience. And when you see yourself that way, and what the the sort of the basis of his book is that we're in a state where we need a spiritual revolution, not a necessarily a religious or back to the basics, because you can go right down the street right here, and you go to any fundamentalist church, you can go to any denomination you want to, and they're going to tell you, we got to get back to the Bible. They're going to thump it. They're going to hit it. We got to get back to the word. We got to get back to what it says. And they'll sit there and tell you, we got to read it literally. Well, literally reading it, uh, is it literally or literarily? What are, we, what are we really reading literally? Because you've got it so mixed up and so confused and so contorted that now we don't even know what's literal or metaphor. We don't even know because you're trying to read it, read the entire Bible univocally when it's a compilation or an anthology of multiple people's experiences with God and how they were brave enough to write down their experience with God and it gets compiled into an anthology that we call the Bible. So when we have these spiritual experiences or back to an idea of, of spirituality, it removes all of the, the areas of separation. Because he points out beautifully in the book, if you go to the, the main religious hub in the world, is right there in Jerusalem where the Temple Mount would be and how three different faiths share the same church the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians, and how literal fights break out as they're transitioning. And it's not just just between the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. There's multiple Christian denominations of different orthodoxes that use it, and they get in fights with each other. The Christians, this orthodox doesn't like this one. They they get your candles out of here, and we're going to get our miters in here, and get your, you know, you've got these guys in big, uh, towering hats and robes that are fighting with each other because they've never gotten outside of burying their face in what they, I just know this is true. Yeah. I just know this, well, this is what I've been taught. This is the way I believe. And it's just how it is. But if you take your face out of that for just a little bit yeah. and you lap it like a dog, then you realize what you were saying with what C.S. Lewis says about seeing somebody as the image of God right. and worshiping at that image. Well, what would that really mean? Would it mean singing a song to that person or bowing down to that person? Or would it mean that I see you as someone so valuable that just like a dog, I want to be next to you. Mm -hmm. I just want to be connected to you because I see God within you. I see you within God and God within you. I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. Right. Right. I want to be a part of you. Right. Yeah. So it's so worship reciprocated adoration is this. When I take Marshall, my son, who's one year old. I take Marshall, and I get home, and he wants me to pick him up and throw him up into the air. And when I pick him up and throw him into the air, there is nothing on the face of this earth that moves that little boy's heart like that moves it. When his daddy takes him and he looks in his daddy's eyes and Mm. sees his daddy's adoration for him, and then as I throw him into the air and I look into his eyes, 
and I see his adoration for me. And this deep giggle, I mean, he, it's like Jordan Peterson talks about it. Like when you play with that rough and tumble play that predominantly comes, you know, from a, from a father figure, yeah. Yeah. that rough and tumble play that a child needs, they don't hardly know what to do with it. Like they, they, got, they don't even know what to do with their, 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 voc yeah. their voice, their, their face. They're just like, ah! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> terror, a little bit of terror, a little bit of, a little bit of, and then, then complete joy, you know. So, so that is like that's worship. I mean, yeah. and then how many services have you walked into? Like, I really want to worship God. I want to just focus. I want to just go for it. I don't want to just. Uh, uh. Marshall doesn't do that when I get home. Right. I was like, he's not. He wants me to. He, he reaches out his arms. That's worship. Yeah. That's worship. Reach out your arms. Be embraced by the one who's embraced you. You talked about, you get, you talk to these people that, that say, well, we just need to get back to the Bible. I say we need to get back to the mirror. Right. You need to get back to the mirror. You need to look in your own eyes. You need to look in your own face. You may not see something that you like at the moment, and that's okay to admit. It's okay to admit that you look in that mirror, and right now I don't see anything I like. Well, you tell him that. You tell him that. Say, God, I don't see what you see. And then when you tell him that, guess what he's going to do? He's going to walk you like he did Gideon through the whole process. And he's going to say, mighty warrior, keep staring. Keep staring, mighty warrior. Keep staring. It has to be you. It had to be you. So Curtis sent this uh, to Michael earlier, Romans 12. In the King James, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, mm -hmm. holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I've always interpreted that as obligation. Yeah. Like, I have to present a good body that hasn't been in sin or hasn't been here doing that or doing this or smoking that or doing, you know, all these things, Oops. you know. I mean, you have to be, that's a presentable body. But then let, let's think about this, though. Out of the NIV, it's just a little bit more precise. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So is that saying that you need to present a body to God that's clean and pure of your own washing? No. It's saying that you should present your body to God as Marshall presents his body to me when I get home from work and say, God, throw me into the air. Throw me into the air and catch me. Yeah. Let's play. Let's do this. Do it tomorrow. If you could present yourself that holy then there's no need for Jesus. Exactly go back right. to the law. Man. Go back to Moses because you can do exactly what the priest did. Right. You can wash yourself ceremonially. You can wear all the garb. You can even have the, the plate over your head that says holiness unto the Lord. Yep. You can keep all the rules. You keep all the regulations. So if you could truly present yourself. So now you have to compare that to Ephesians 1 where it says, where he says that it was his good pleasure. He destined us for the adoption of his children through Jesus Christ according to his good pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom. He's made unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. They set forth in Christ. Man, I'm, I skipped it. Where was it? Oh, dang. I went, I went too far. Uh... Yeah, just as, uh, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy. Then if you read it even in the King James, it says that he presents us holy to himself. Yeah. So if you could present yourself holy, then the way that you're doing so is just through the confession. The word is homologia. So I'm just going to say the same thing that he says. So like you said, if I look in the mirror and I don't see myself as what he says about me, he says that I'm holy, and he says, yes, what if I look in the mirror and say, I don't see it, but I'm going to say I am who you say I am. And that's the, so the church has taken the, the cognitive behavioral therapy route of I, I see something that I don't necessarily like and I immediately need to change it. Or I'm thinking something, I'm thinking a certain way, I just need to change it. I just need to change it. And I mean, we think on, on in terms of metanoia, that's a, it's a change in the way of thinking, but it's not oh, I had a bad thought, let me change that thought. Or, oh, I thought negatively about myself, let me change that thought, let me replace it with this or replace it with that. And what you find is with these other types of therapies, we've talked a little bit about internal family systems and things like that, but experiential 
therapies is that when when you come into that moment of oh I don't really like that thought or I don't see what you see God or I don't really see what people would like about me or I don't really know you know why would I go to this party nobody's going to talk to me nobody wants to hang out with me sit with the thought let the thought be what the thought's going to be and you go on and do what you're going to do you go on and be who you're going to be you don't let that impede you you let that thought sit there hang out do whatever it's going to do and then you continue on like you're saying with whatever God's saying yeah. hey you know what that's okay you stay right there you do your thing I'm going to do this I'm going to look in the mirror and say hey I may not fully believe this right now I may totally believe that everybody at this party hates me and doesn't want to hang out with me and doesn't like me and thinks my nose is too big but I'm going to say I have a beautiful nose Right, and people do actually like me. I know three people right off the top of my head that like me. I think even right? if I do have a big nose, even, <laughs> even if, if I, I do have, have a big, big nose, nose. <laughs> it just means I'm breathing more of the oxygen in the room, <laughs> so I'm really healthy. But uh, to your point, I think that's I think that's what Judges six demonstrates about Gideon, because he he's talking to this angel of God. He's telling them, "Hey, look, I'm the least yeah. in my father's house. I, I you know." I'm the guy that's out here threshing wheat in our empty wine press. And what what I think the significance to that is, is wheat is often referred to as the staff of life. And that it is a longstanding symbol of fertility, bounty, and resurrection. And then when I looked it up a little bit further, as if that's not good enough, the significance of wheat in a biblical sense, from what the scholars have said, is that it illustrates, and Jesus uses this metaphor with the grain of wheat. When he uses that metaphor, it illustrates the importance of ego death in the pursuit of salvation and entering the kingdom of heaven. And when you talk about the, the, it representing ego death, I think a lot of times when we talk about ego, we get, we get caught up in those that are seeking power, those that are seeking control, those that are looking to dominate and impose their will on others. But there's a different side of ego, and that different side of ego discounts your ability. It eliminates you from having power. It eliminates you from imposing your will. There are different temperaments and there are different personality traits for a reason. And you can become just as egotistical in the supine or the bowing out or the, the discounting yourself as you can in the authority and the power of seeking dominion. So what are we seeing here with this symbolism in the story of Gideon is he's threshing wheat in a wine press. God, I wish we still had grapes. God, I wish we still could use this wine press for what it's good for, what it's made for. But I am going to thresh this staff of life because that is going to make bread. That's going to be the strongest source of carbohydrates. Crumbs. Crumbs. That's that, right, crumbs. that even the crumbs we can survive on. Uh, and, and that's what I'm going to be out here doing. And then when Jesus comes and says, you're a mighty man of valor. You have a force either by your own means or through your resources oh well what is the symbolism behind this grain of wheat that jesus talks about is it's the ego death in the pursuit of salvation and what is gideon tasked with doing saving the people but he first has to go through the process of dying to himself and his own perceived image of who he is he's really faced with a moment where God shows up and shows him the first real mirror he's ever really looked into and in that reflecting moment from threshing the wheat in the wine press in a place where you shouldn't even be having to do that but we have to because if they see us threshing wheat then they'll come and steal that from us too so he's even being wise in what he's doing by going to a place that's already been pillaged and plundered to hide that fact from those who would continually do that to him. And in that, he's proving that he has a force of resources in and of himself. You're wise enough and smart enough to know your enemy, so you're wise enough and smart enough to 
overcome your enemy. If you'll only look into this mirror, Gideon, if you'll only see that you're a mighty man of valor, and by your hand and your strength will you deliver the people. You'll be the salvation in this time, in this era, in this moment. And that, that's where we just get... Then, then I, I want to ask this question because all that's great. But I think, I think what stood out to me about the story, yeah, that was, that was a little pat on my own back there. I didn't realize that. Uh, you can consider all of that great if you choose. You don't have to. I think it's pretty great. But I think, the, like I think the, the, the bigger part of the story that really stands out to me is he, he tears down this, this, uh, this idol of Baal, and he, he cuts down the grove. And the grove, of course, comes from the word Asherah, which is a place designated for idol worship, which comes from the deity Ashtaroth, which means a star, and is the principal female deity of the Phoenicians, and they worship this deity in war and fertility. And that, that, that same idea, I think, ties into Matthew 15 in that this place where Jezebel was sacrificing children, because that's what they would do, these fertility gods, in order for the gods to grace them with more life, they would sacrifice the lives of children so that they could get more children, which makes zero common sense. Yep. But that is the motivational and inspirational forces within that have been deified into some deity that really doesn't exist. You're not taking personal responsibility for the way that you're living or the way that you're conducting your affairs or the way that you're actually uh, engaging in sex and marriage and the like to get the results of population and being fruitful and multiplying. So when he tears down that grove where I wanted to pose this question, and I think this is a good spot to probably to park it on, is Joe Ash's defense. Mm -hmm. When he comes to the defense of his son, because you have, you have a Christophany in, in Gideon in that moment. He becomes the salvation of the people. But Joash, I think, stands in the seat of God the Father in that moment. And that's, that's what I wanted to pick your three brains about because that's what just stood out to me as kind of the linchpin. Like, man, if you needed any more support, your dad coming to you coming to the people and saying, look, you want to take my son? Why don't you let the God who that idol was for and the grove that you used to worship that God in, why don't you let you take my, let, let him take my son? Because I'm not going to allow you to do that. And I just thought that was like, you know, with all the, with all the stuff that Gideon's doing and all the great story behind that, Joash really steps up and hits an absolute home run. So whoever wants to, to take that beyond where I've taken it. Well, the first thing that jumps in my head is you talk about it being a tie-in with God the Father, and I go straight to the baptism with John the Baptist and Jesus, where the seal of the Holy Spirit is is then on the as descends as a dove, and Abba says, the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And when Joash wakes up and the town what probably comes knocking on his door, and says, get out here. Your son has done this. And he walks out there. In that moment, he sees the rubble of Baal, the, the, the I can't say the word, the ash, Asherah, for the, the tree, the grove tore down. He has the option to say, you're right. This is, this is not how we do things. This is, this is wrong. This is not how we do it. This is the religious way to do it would be, yeah. He needs to die. But instead, when Marshall is the one that I throw up into the air, and in him I see me, and in me he sees himself, and it's this reciprocal adoration. Joash, in that moment, saw something that he couldn't do himself. It had to be Gideon, and it was his son, and it was Joash's way of saying, let Baal talk for himself. Let Baal fight his own battles. If Baal's this big dude, if Baal can do it, let him stand up. Let him jump back up and fight. But Gideon's my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The one thing that's interesting that what leads up to that 
and w- the way you connect it to the spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. The way that, and then with what you said about the wheat, you know how they, th- how they thresh wheat. You have to have, for one, you have to have something with two stones. So it would have to be one above the head and one on, on the ground. Usually it would be in a cave, but it has to have a place where the wind blows through. It has to be open on both sides. You take bundles of the wheat, you throw it as hard as you can against the stone above. And the things that don't last, the wind blows it out, blows it this direction. The things that you don't need, it blows it away. And what remains is what falls to the ground. And that's what you create the sustenance with. So prior to this happening, he's doing something. The spirit is already in motion. The spirit is already trying to, yeah, the breath of God is already blowing away all these things that you don't need. All of these bad views of yourself, these lower views of yourself where you say that I can't do it. I'm the, I'm the run of the litter. I'm, I'm nobody. Well, you're still part of the pack. That's what the spirit is saying to him. You might be the run of the litter, but you're still part of the pack, and you're going to do it as one. You're going to do it as one. Let the spirit blow away all of those bad ideas, all of those bad concepts of yourself. And even if you have to go in the dead of night, because that's when he says he does it. He goes in the middle of the night where nobody's going to see him do it. We're going to rip up all these places, that all these religious ideas, all these religious thoughts. And I can't tell you how many times that it was with me in the middle of the night and it was my notebook and my Bible and just trying to figure out why I don't believe in this? Why do I believe in this? Where did this come from? And in the middle of the night where nobody's awake, nobody's around, and I'm, I'm just studying and finding in the Scripture that, no, the Bible doesn't say that. And some places, yeah, the Bible does say this, and this is why it says this, and this is why I believe that. And tearing down the, the groves of Ashtaroth, tearing down the poles of Baal, tearing down all of these old religious ideas that didn't do anything for me, that didn't give It it was sacrificing children for the sake of having children. It it didn't work. It was the same concepts over and over, just regurgitating the same old religious nonsense that never gave life. And when you finally let the wind of spirit blow all that stuff away, even if it is in the wind in the middle of the night of getting rid of all of those bad thoughts about yourself, the dark night of the soul, having the dark night of the soul is a necessity. And in the dark night of the soul, he starts ripping out all of the things that don't belong. And his father says, you did the work. Yeah. You did exactly what you were supposed to and do. And how, how similar is that to what Jesus accomplishes in the Garden of Gethsemane? At night, yeah. when no one can stay awake, right. and everybody's asleep, and nobody's paying attention, he's dealing with his ideas about himself. Yeah. He's dealing with his capabilities, his potentialities, whether he's going to drink from the cup that's been set before him, whether his will is going to be supplanted by the Father's will. And in that moment, he has the victory, just as Gideon had the victory in what he was able to overcome and what he was able to do in the dark of night. And as dark nights... Uh, because I'm a Batman fan, so I'm throwing that out there. Uh, I'd ask that uh, you like, comment, and subscribe. We're getting things worked up with Subsplash to get our website up and running. We're going to have links put in the bio soon enough for you to be able to give. Uh, and also, and also, you know, just comment, follow us, and have another resource to go to. Uh, it's going to open us up to a lot of other venues and platforms that we can do this on. We're going to get a podcast jump started. So we're going to try to get – we're jumping in with both feet. Yeah. Uh, and I hope that – I hope that you enjoyed tonight's format. If you did, please leave a comment and let us know as we like to continue putting out content. We'd like to continue putting out life that uh, you all want to see and you all are very engaged with. So hit that like button before you leave uh, and raise your hand and repeat after me. I love him. I love him. Because he first. Because he first. Love me. Love me. God bless you and we'll see you next time.